It is a pleasure to welcome on your behalf for the board, the school. We were just talking now and he said the last time he gave a talk on TAG at the Architects Association was 40 years ago. In fact, as some of you might have seen in a recent interview with BAJ, Walter Ball said that he never thought he would leave to see uh, Prague free. Not only did, but uh, in the 90s he has returned to Prague in 1990 as an advisor to the chief architect of Prague, and more recently in 95 as part of a team set up by Welling Davis to assist uh, the city council of Prague in the strategic planning of Prague. In a sense, I suppose it's not just a return to Prague, it was also a return to uh, Wellington Davis to some extent, uh, uh, one of the most influential and uh, important planning uh, practices in Britain in the post war, uh, of which Walter Paul was a partner after 1966. Uh, Walter Paul immigrated from Czechoslovakia to Britain. Uh, 39. And from Britain, he established a very distinguished career as an architect and planner, um, a career that uh, spans across the world and uh, over many, many years, over 40 years of work as a planner. He uh, was involved in the London, London Council Council in the early 60s as deputy uh, planning officer. Uh, in the mid 60s, he was the planning officer for Liverpool. Uh, he has been involved in the planning of many new towns in Britain, including the in Liverpool Keys, and across the world. Has been involved in urban redevelopment programs and projects uh, from Colombia to China, from Hong Kong to the Caribbean. And in a sense, uh, I suppose it is with this vast accumulated experience as a planner that he returned in the 90s to Prague. And uh, he is uh, recently in that same interview with the AJ, he expressed very optimistically that he found Prague had changed beyond recognition for the better. That he thought Prague was now uh, strong enough to confront without fears the developers. And uh, I suppose in many ways we're all very curious to hear more about that and what kind of strength that is. And so we're welcome. Good evening. Sorry. When I listen to a sort of eulogy, I sometimes think I'm present at my own funeral. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what it is about, what I'm going to do. First of all, I'll show you a series of slides. Then five groups. First of all, the general impression and the history of the development of Prague, particularly under Charles IV. Then I'll take you on a very brisk walk through the historic core. You can't stop and linger as you would like to because there's no time for it. Then just a few slides showing you 20th century architecture in Prague. And then we come to a rather sad story of the Prague under Soviet domination. And finally, uh, what Prague is, has been since the Velvet Revolution. So I think we'll, we'll start with the slides right away. Do I switch this off or do I leave it? It's OK. Is it all right? Well, some general impressions. This is, of course, a very well-known view. Rock in winter, which I also saw this time. It looks as magic as I always. Here's a view of the castle from the side, sideways. It's like a wonderful piece of sculpture, which looks quite different and, uh, uh, from, from various points of view. Prague, the city of a hundred spires. And here is another spire has been added 
television communication spa. Well, um, at first I was a bit annoyed with it, but I've come to live with it as long as it is as thin and elegant as this. I'm afraid our, we don't build that sort of thing for use anymore. Either people work there or live there, and then you get very unpleasant um, uh, boxes. Now, uh, Prague was already well established by the year 1230. You can see in the middle there the old town square, if I can. No. Mm. Yeah. Here's the old town square. Now, Prague was on the on the route from Nuremberg to Krakow and from Dresden to Vienna. So the, the market was formed there around the square and by the year 1230 there was already a fairly fair sized community there. Now Prague has two major uh, fortresses. This is the Hradschani castle and this is the Vyshehrad castle. This one is actually earlier. And here it is. There's not much left of it. Some of the fortifications here. The rest, uh, the towers, of course, they, they are uh, 19th century. This is the oldest building in Prague, in Vyshehrad, a Romanesque round church. And this is quite an interesting uh, <coughs> diagram. Uh, Prague, in fact, the oldest part of, part of Prague is something called Havelske Miesto, which is the city of Havel, but has nothing to do with Václav Havel. That was there even before the market here. Behind the, behind the church here, the, a market has formed, which is called Ungelt, and to the north of it, this part was the Jewish ghetto, and of which the synagogue still remains. And, and over here, uh, a community, St. Gallens, developed at that time. Ja Charles IV was the Holy Roman Empire, uh, Emperor. And he is the most remarkable man, they educated in France, spoke and wrote seven languages, and uh, was a real visionary. The city which he took over uh, was really the city here of the old town, the market here, and the castle here. The first thing uh, he quite rightly identified is the question of access. There was an old wooden bridge here, which he replaced with the Charles Bridge. The next thing was to secure what was there with the wall. The next thing beyond that, and he realized that Prague in its central position was going to be a major, a major city. And that was something which uh, was really visionary. He then realized that Prague had that castle here and another castle here. And the need was for a linear development to link up with Vyshehrad here, and in doing so, form the new town, which is this here. And this new town had a major, and a very, um, frankly, I think an oversized square here, the Charles Square, which was leading to, to the old town hall. Then another one here, which is now the Vatsvatsky Namjestje, and the third one here. This one didn't quite come up and he also introduced the lateral connection between the two. Uh, <coughs> so this is really strategic planning at its best. And the framework which he laid down in terms of streets and squares, you see, this is already a different scale from what you get in this part. This is the old town and this is the new town. And so all this here, all the framework was laid down under Charles IV. And here it is. This is the infrastructure which dates back to Charles IV. Now, 
At one time, there was an economic crisis, believe it or not, and a lot of people were unemployed. So instead of doling out uh, unemployment benefit, he uh, uh, suggested that, or actually proposed, there should be another wall built here around the Hradšany Castle. It's of no great strategic importance, but it gave people some work. And so that was the first public works. Uh, here's the Charles Bridge. Uh, nowadays, this will be an extremely rare view because usually it's full of tourists. Sometimes it's standing room only. And this is part of the Charles University, the second university in Europe, the first one in Bologna. So, you know, here the real comprehensive vision what Prague was, was about. And finally, this has then resulted in what is now, nowadays called the historic core of Prague. And it consists of the Hradšany castle, of the old town here, of the, new ta of the small town here, and the new town here. And uh, much of it is not very clear here. For instance, the slopes on this side down to the river are so steep, fortunately, that they can't be built upon. And so you get a very dramatic picture of this castle precinct and the, and the small new town, a uh, small town nestling below, and the huge area of greenery, and that has been maintained throughout the ages. Right, that's the next plot. Now, just very quickly, you have to rush through uh, the whole historic area. Now, this is typical looking down from the town hall uh, to the old part. This is the Melantrix uh, Street. As you see, houses almost touch each other. <coughs> this is the newly uh, rehabilitated uh, Seletna Street, which leads to the um, to the powder tower, and this route was taken, it's called the coronation route, from the powder tower along here to the old town square and through a winding Kaloa street over the Charles Bridge up to the castle. Um, very interesting, it's completely, it's crooked, that road. It's, uh, some, some of the bends are so sharp that you wonder how the carriages could get round it. It's not a monumental street. Prague hasn't got monumental streets. The Old Town Hall, the Old Town Square, and quite interesting, I would like you first, and there's of course the Teen Square here, and these houses, the, the arcades, giving scale to this wonderful building. And I would like you to concentrate for a moment on this building, which I remember before the war uh, was a rather undistinguished rock building as one of thousands of similar ones. But uh, in, the, in, the, in the, uh, the course of restoration, they discovered there were Gothic arches underneath. And so the re result is, oh, we have lost that one. Anyhow, I was going back to, uh, never mind. Uh, you have already seen it. Hmm? Yeah, here it is, you see? Uh, uh, restored Gothic and they put the hood on it. I think they simply, they think they found some uh, traces. Each building, in Pra each building in the historic core has a complete history. And uh, this building is now being used for uh, uh, chamber music concerts and small exhibition. This is one of the many arcades. This leads actually to the new uh, small town square. And uh, just one of the many delightful details, wrote Anne work. Here we are in the Jewish quarter. Uh, what is left of the ghetto? This is the Jewish town hall. And this is the uh, only relic of the uh, Jewish buildings of the time, the, the synagogue, which goes back to the uh, 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 13th century, beginning of the 13th century. And uh, this is a view of the S Jewish cemetery where there are layers, up to five layers above each other because that was the only place where Jews could be buried. 
this is how many of the old town buildings still look with a sort of uh, balcony going round. Um, it's, uh, it's mixed blessing. Uh, you are, I mean, you know, the, it's courtyard which can contain a lot of noise and, uh, and the lack of privacy, but uh, this is how li people have been living for a long time. This is a typical building which sort of hugs the streets as in, their, in their curvature and so on, which has been recently restored. And uh, here we are uh, looking uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the Old Town Bridgehead towards San Salvador, uh, Baroque building in the background and another building of the period, another co uh, church on the left. Uh, before you get from the Charles Bridge to the little town, it, there is a, an island there it's called Campa or Little Venice, and here's a view of it. And uh, this is, I think, one of the m most brilliant uh, pieces of urban design. Uh, when Dietzenhofer had to position his, church, his dome, and single tower. I think it's one of the few Baroque churches, a single tower. Uh, he looked at this very carefully and placed it into the, in the gap between these two uh, towers of the bridge. Here's a detail of it. Um, <coughs> the new town, uh, sorry, the small town, Malastana, uh, has a large number of very uh, spacious and very impressive palaces. This one is the Waldstein Palace. Waldstein was one of the uh, most important generals during the Thirty Years' War and uh, obviously quite well off. And he built himself his loggia and uh, the palace and uh, the gardens are used in summer for concerts and behind it is uh, part of the cathedral. And this is the Neruda Street, which curves its way uh, up to, towards the castle. And that was the last lap of the coronation route. And uh, here we are in the castle square. This is perhaps a slightly unusual view as compared with this, which of course is very usual and very well known. And I've taken this one during the uh, Soviet uh, regime, and you see the guard there is in battle dress. Now that is the new, new uh, uniform which was designed by Foreman for uh, Havel and uh, looks much smarter and much more peaceful. And this is the balcony, this is a sort of main entrance to the president's suite, and he, this is where Havel uh, after his election addressed the crowd. This is uh, the, old, uh, the, small, uh, the golden lane where under Rudolf II, who was more of a scientist and uh, an explorer and uh, a talent scout rather than a very effective emperor, uh, he had alchemists working here uh, trying to produce gold, and surprise, surprise, they never succeeded. And down, this is the view down into the uh, Malastrana with its courtyards and, and very impressive palaces. And here's yet another view. And the staircase leading down, and you, the view changes as you proceed. <coughs> this little villa here, was uh, left to, uh, uh, Mozart was uh, living here. Um, the owner was a man called Dusek, and Mozart composed here and uh, was in Prague uh, during the perfor first performance of his Don Giovanni. And this took place in this theater, which is now fully restored to its former glory. It, this is absolutely a must if you're in Prague to go inside. This is a unique building. Right, and this this one, it, this is Wenceslas Square. 
Well, it isn't a square, really. It's a, it's a boulevard. Yeah. And of all the spaces in Prague, this is the least uh, successful. Somehow it hasn't come to terms what it is about. And I, I understand just only last week, uh, uh, the Prince's Trust had arranged uh, a kind of symposium there of Czech and British architects and planners trying to suggest proposals, what could be done. They've taken the trams out, which I think is a, is a mistake. The bottom part of it, lower part, has been pedestrianized, but it's a mess. So you really don't know uh, what it is about. Some of the buildings have been rebuilt rather badly, and so this is still a problem area. But it is the biggest place, public space, and during the Velvet Revolution, it played a very important part. Um, very briefly, Prague of the 20th century is a very rich mix of, of all the developments in architecture of that period. This is from the Secession period. Uh, this is a cubist, the cubist, uh, cubism in architecture is an entirely Czech speciality. This one is by my uh, former professor Otakar Novotny. It's by no means the best. The best one probably is Gocha's Black Madonna, but that wasn't available to be taken. It's now, it's now the restoration is now finished. And here are some examples of extraordinary interesting buildings. This is Plechnik's church. Uh, which I think is a re very remarkable building, both outside and inside. Um, of course, the Pensions Institute, uh, which in some ways was pioneering the idea of, a, of uh, not building in, in, in streets and, 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 and blocks, but opening it up with, if I may say so, rather mixed results. And this is one of the <coughs> modern buildings by Kisela in, in, in the Wenceslas Square. There are several of them. And it shows that Prague, Prague's genius in many ways is to absorb different periods within its urban structure uh, and yet uh, not disturb the unity of the urban environment. This is probably one of the most exciting and brilliant uh, piece of modern architecture by Otakar Novotny again. It's the Manes Center, Art Center, which is, adjoins a Gothic tower with a Baroque roof. There was a tremendous outcry when this was first built, but now they love it, and, and it's one of Havel's favorite buildings. He had a flat just opposite. And this Barandov, which is a um, again, a very interesting development, or a, a hotel and restaurant, and below, below the rocks, swimming pool, which is, uh, has not been reinstated yet. And also the uh, place where the Czech film industry is done. Now, we come to the growth of Prague. Now, the, the most extraordinary thing is this. Here is the historic core as visualized by Charles IV. Now that actually lasted from 1350 to 1850. S he had planned ahead so far, so many centuries, that it was still the Prague as he had visualized it and had lasted till 18. Then it started to grow. Um, uh, obviously, industrialization came in, and the city grew and grew and grew. And now, the city is a huge area with 1.3 million people. The total population of the Czech Republic is 13 million, so it's exactly one third, and has been large, greatly uh, expanded during the last uh, 40 years or so, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And here it is. Uh, it doesn't appear to be a very clear, clearly structured 
development, and it isn't. It's very haphazard. What, what the communist regime has achieved, quantitatively, is very impressive. They rehouse, they've rehoused a third of Prague's population. But how? In high-rise, uh, they call them panelaki, uh, prefabricated blocks of flats, with hardly any uh, shops and certainly no uh, employment opportunities. They call them, they used to call them new towns, they in fact huge dormitories. Uh, and uh, Prague, the downside of Prague are the various problems they have with uh, the environment. Prague is in a valley and retains uh, 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 all the um, unpleasant side products of industrialization of car pollution and so on. And these are various studies and various uh, uh, ways of identifying uh, the impact on the environment and ways of overcoming them. And I must say that uh, they have already done a, an, an enormous amount. Most of the brown coal um, uh, has been phased out. It's particularly beastly stuff with a lot of SO2. And they are, they've uh, changed over to, to gas. And they are taking the whole thing very seriously because it is a major issue which could have very negative effects on the future of Prague. Now, um, the good news from the, and I don't think there's any, any regime which is totally bad and totally good, uh, and that applies to the Soviet regime as well. There were some good points, and this is a very important thing. They have bequeathed to Prague three metro lines. And uh, sometimes it's a good idea to be last because you can learn from the mistakes of others. These are very good. It's a very good metro system. It's well designed. The stations are uh, really, some of them are ex excellent. And um, it works. Um, and in here, for instance, now. This is, a, this is the entrance to one of the stations. I think this was a brilliant piece of design by the Czech architects. Um, the Waldstein Palais and the gardens adjoin it here. And uh, this space was laid out in the very, very attractively. And you actually enter the underground down here. So I think they can really be proud of that. And here it is, uh, it's clean, spacious, and uh, works well, and very, very punctual. Now, the downside. Uh, they, this dates back to the days, and to the 80s, I think, when it was still thought, at least in the Soviet bloc, that it is possible to accommodate the car in, in the city almost without restriction, and to give it as good an access as possible. Now, w one could argue that the outer ring and the inner ring may be necessary to um, relieve the, these zones from through traffic, but they do cause very difficult problems in the feeder roads into it which are ent almost entirely residential streets, and uh, it's hell to live there. Now, the, the biggest mistake they made was to take this route, which in incidentally comes from Vienna all the way through here, and instead of taking it round, they actually went right through the center, through the very center, hugging the historic core. Uh, at this point here, where the Wenceslas Square is, there's a pincer movement around the beautiful Neorazacens Museum, and it's hell. And this is an, a, a terrible thing to do. Here's the museum, and this, is the, this used to be House of Parliament, one of the ugliest buildings they've produced. There are many others. Um, uh, this is a, a slide which, is, in some ways, is very typical. It is menacing, as, as it's shown here. And that masterpiece by Praga is this. I mean, it really is just hideous. 
and uh, uh, beyond it is a multi-story car park. I can still remember this. This was a beautiful street here to hold Wilsonova. There was a cafe here where I used to uh, read uh, che uh, Czech and foreign papers, etc. It was all part of, a, of the uh, fabric, and now it's been completely ruined. And it's so ugly and so uh, uh, unfriendly that the parliament has decided they will not go back under any circumstances, and they are going back to the uh, Malostansky Namiesti, which is uh, a little town. They have restored the buildings externally, but gutted them inside, and it's another uh, questionable solution. But this is there now, and this now, I think, being used by Radio Free Europe. Um, now, here are some other masterpieces. This is the National Theatre, another very fine neoclassical building, and this uh, Amoeba-like building is a new theater, and um, there here's another one. And um, well, I was standing there uh, um, one day when there's this tram stop just opposite, and the elderly man uh, got out. And after the tram had passed, he hadn't been there before. He looked and said, "Oh my God, what have they done?" And that's really. Um, the sad story. Now this obviously is, a, is one of these international hotels, the atrium, which could be anywhere. Completely international architecture of no particular merit, uh, probably taken from, from the drawer and plonked here. Um, but it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be in Prague, it shouldn't be in this particular area. Now, this is uh, part of the castle precinct. These are the uh, Romanesque towers of the church here, St. George. And lurking behind is one of the new towns, the northern new town on the horizon. And I do not think it has contributed very much to the scene. Here's the um, television tower. And you see, this is what has happened. This is a view which is fairly new, where, because the president's, cast, uh, president's garden is here, which was not open even under Masaryk, and has now been opened and beautifully restored. But as you descend, this is the view you get. These delightful towers, and suddenly you've got these lumpy uh, office buildings. And finally, the Velvet Revolution. So you see the new town, the Wenceslas Square has its uses. The revolution actually took place here. You may wonder why it was so bloodless. I think there are two reasons. One was that the government knew it was, it was all over and didn't fight very, very hard. And the other one was that Havel, who led the dissidents, promised them there will be no revenge. They will get off scot-free. Well, there it is, and they did, and uh, um, it all happened without bloodshed. And this, I think, <laughs> in a way, characterizes what's happening now. This is the lower part of Wenceslas Square, and what was, it's all symbolic, that what was right before is wrong now, and what is wrong now was right before. It's all upside down. And uh, the Prague has become a very civilized place again. This is part of the, of the street which surrounds the old town. And there was a, this was taken immediately after the Velvet Revolution when they had a public exhibition of the period, what has happened the proclamations and the posters and so on of that period, because people had been kept in total ignorance and were only told what the government wanted them to know. And just here uh, in the foreground is a, is a statue of Masaryk, who was one of the D founders of the Czech Re Czechoslovak Republic in 1918, and who became a non-person under the communists. And these statues, uh, I don't know about this particular one, but I know several of them 
have an interesting history in that they were there until 1938. Then they were taken down when the Germans came in 39. Then they were brought back in 1945. Then they were taken down again in 48. Then they were taken back again in, in 68 and taken down again in 69 and they are back again. So <laughs> that is typical of what is happening. And you see, this is Paris, really, people sitting out and uh, having a good time. And it is a very, very attractive, lively city now, as you see here. That's the Hus Memorial and a few tourists around it. And this is Prague, some of the illuminations. And this is something Prague has never changed. <coughs> OK, can we have the lights, please? Now, my personal involvement has already been sketched out. Um, I was invited by the chief architect to assist him in the planning of Prague. Um, he was actually one of the architects who was responsible for some of the new towns. And he explained to me they meant to have shops, they meant to have cultural facilities, they meant to have, they meant to have works. Uh, 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 employment opportunities, but every time they reserved a place for that, the government and the government planned Prague. They said, no, 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 we have got to have more housing. It's the housing is the priority. So uh, he was partly responsible, but it is difficult for somebody who has been in that position to change overnight or even within a few years. And when I, when he asked me to help him to update the development plan, uh, I said, uh, look, uh, you shouldn't really waste your time uh, with that at the moment. You must know where you're going. You must uh, think of the directions which, uh, in which Prague will develop. You know, the, there must be a strategy. And she said, no, 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 you don't understand that the, the need is to update the development plan, you see. They call it Malu Eme Plani, they are painting zones, and that was his concept. Anyhow, I tried for several years to persuade him that uh, he, Prague needs strategic planning, but he couldn't quite make it, couldn't understand. Anyhow, he was dismissed, actually, for incompetence, and uh, new councillors came in, and they saw some of my reports and called me in, and we discussed the whole thing, and the upshot was that, first of all, they sent a, a group of planners uh, to, to, and, and, and councillors to this country, and they uh, uh, talked to the uh, London Planning Advisory Committee and to Birmingham people and to uh, Edinburgh people about strategic planning, and, uh, and eventually, in uh, 95, the mayor of Prague requested help from the Noha Fund, and uh, we had to compete for the job, but we got it. And uh, I'm now going to um, indicate what, what, we, what it is about by actually reading from the, our submission, which was, I hope, carefully composed to um, focus on the real issues. As a result of major historic events, our cities undergo from time to time fundamental changes which have profound and lasting effects upon them and their citizens. For example, London after the Great Fire, during and after the Industrial Revolution, and after the Second World War. In the case of Prague, such a historic event was the recent Velvet Revolution. These are the moments in a city's history when it is vitally important to understand and foresee the nature of the impending changes and make the appropriate, well-informed and wise decisions to guide its future development for the benefits of its citizens. After nearly 50 years of dictatorship, 
Prague is approaching the sixth anniversary of its newfound freedom, with the transition from a command to a market economy, successfully completed. As a result, Prague has revived itself spectacularly, and its historic core has become the jewel of Central Europe, attracting worldwide tourism and indigenous as well as foreign investment to an unprecedented extent. Historic Park, Prague, has been designated by UNESCO in 1992 as of world importance. Some major public spaces have been dedicated to pedestrians and the streets are full of bustling light again. The happy coincidence of this uniquely beautiful historic heritage, which is in the process of being successfully restored with the skill and the entrepreneurial spirit of its citizens is among Prague's greatest strengths. Another important asset is the city's high quality metro system. At the same time, Prague suffers from alarming threats and serious weaknesses. The main threats are coming from the pressures for more commerce, tourism, and gentrification in the center, for commerce and industry in the new towns, so-called new towns, secondary centers, and peripheral areas, from the decline of old industries leaving derelict sites, and from some, mainly foreign investors, who impose upon the city massive developments which are insensitive to Prague's unique and very vulnerable ambience. Further, such mar marring is the result of having provided in the past for increased access by motor cars into the inner city by, for example, and I've already mentioned that, routing an urban motorway along an alignment adjoining the historic core and an increasing proliferation of private cars ad adding substantially to the city's serious environmental pollution problems. A new balance must be struck between a sustainable environment and a buoyant market economy. Prague's most telling weaknesses are its administrative fragmentation coupled with quite inadequate support from central government it outdated and often irrelevant legislation in need of radical reform. They are, they are seriously inhibiting the city's ability to solve its problems uh, with imagination and innovative <coughs> possessions. Now, this fragmentation is interesting because it's a reaction against the over-centralization by the communist regime. They did all the planning, they never asked any, anybody for their opinion. They really dictated what was going to happen. The reaction against that immediately after the Velvet Revolution was, we don't want any authority to plan Prague. Prague will have its 57 little units, and each of them should do the planning. Now, that is anarchy, of course. And at that time, they were actually thinking of the, uh, abolishing the Greater Land, uh, the, uh, the Prague City Council. And we got there just in time to tell them the damage they could do by abolishing a, a central authority for, for the city as we have here in, in, in London. Um, and it was touch and go that the city council would be abolished. It wasn't. And at the moment, it's a very complicated situation. You've got two, two types of administration in Prague. You've got the government represented by uh, 15 to 18 districts. Uh, and then you have the city council represented uh, by up to 50, between 52 and 57 small units. And uh, obviously, uh, this is uh, very difficult to handle. And uh, the other thing is that the legislation, of course, hasn't caught up yet. In fact, strategic, there's no legal basis for doing strategic planning, as I was reminded by the uh, chief architect time and again. So you have to do something which is not yet law, and then the law has to follow, unfortunately. So. However, due to Prague's previous enforced isolation, the city council and their staff, however competent, lack the necessary experience for the complex task. As a result, the mayor of Prague 
has applied for know-how fund technical assistance which would enable the city's councillors and their professional staff to rise to the occasion and produce a holistic, imaginative and implementable development strategy for Prague. Now let me describe what it is about. This assistance, and incidentally, before I come to that, I, I don't know how many people realize that, but um, the government we have got is um, probably not the best we have ever had. But every now and then, they do something which is actually sensible. And uh, I think the know-how fund, the idea of the know-how fund is an extremely intelligent and worth, um, uh, appropriate um, uh, move. Instead of pumping money um, into, into these uh, post-communist countries, which would disappear, without trace. Um, it's a transfer of knowledge. And I think that is, you know, the software rather than the hardware. And that's what we are doing. Now this assistant project is about intensive, highly committed, and serious joint working with the city to study in depth and develop practical answers to the complex issues it is facing. The city of Prague has skilled and capable politicians and professional staff, but they lack the experience the sort of, planning, of the sort of planning and development responses which are necessary in Western democratic market economies. Technology transfer, capacity building, and institutional development are the key elements in this proposal. The task the strategic planning of the city of Prague is one of the most stimulating and challenging which exists today. The city of Prague has recognized this challenge as well as the opportunity and has made a start by producing strategic vision in Prague 2010 and established a strategic, a strategic planning team. Prague 2010 is a good statement of intentions and now has to be developed and interpreted in detail for it to become ac actionable. The purpose of the Commission is to assist and reinforce these initiatives through contributing Britain's experience of strategic planning and management of major cities. This is applied in three ways. First of all, the strategic plan for Prague. Strategic plan is a new form of plan and planning for Prague, as for other countries of Central and Eastern Europe. To produce it requires new skills, techniques, and, and processes, as well as addressing emerging issues to do with market pressures and private choices, and balancing these with wider public interests. The project will provide experience and ex expertise on these aspects in the form of technical assistance and advice to the strategic planning team and the many other agencies which have the role to, a role to play in, in Prague's future. The public, now the public has been completely ignored in the past, the public will also have an important role to play preparing strategic plan and the city intend to involve them as fully and effectively as possible. This is a relatively new aspect of planning in Prague. The authorities are inexperienced in the techniques to carry out public participation successfully. This will form an important part of the project. Now capacity building means that the project concentrates on providing technological transfer to the strategic planning team and thereby increasing its capacity in strategic planning. In other words, in a, it's an enabling process. The consultants are not only applying their experience to the plan making process, but also, very positively, the strategic planning team members. The aim is that this will have to be achieved by the end of the project and no further assistance of this nature will be required. The same point applies to the many other agencies and parties who are involved in strategic planning for Prague. The project will also aim to enhance their cap capacities in strategic planning at both at individual and agency levels. 
a very important aspect is institutional development. As well as strategic planning team, there are other departments in the city of Prague, the boroughs, the government ministries, and surrounding municipalities who are all involved in determining the future of Prague. Many of these are undertaking work which forms a vital part of the city's strategy, but they are unclear as to how they should contribute to the process. The project will consider procedures to allow them to participate effectively and create partnerships with the city of Prague. This will involve better working arrangements, but will also involve a clear articulation, rationalization of responsibilities. From the above points, it is apparent that building a solid and successful working relationship with the strategic team and other agencies is, a fundament is fundamental to the success of the project. We believe that we already have built the foundations for such a relationship. And finally, what are the main issues? First of all, the strategic plan itself. Strategic plan has a different role from the recently prepared draft city development plan, which is essentially land use zoning and development control tool. Strategic plan has a broader function. It provides the direction, policies and priorities and programs for action. It provides the basis for detailed planning and development control. It provides the framework for investment. It will define the future economy of Prague and how this is achieved through job creation, regeneration, and new opportunities. It will define practical approaches to tackling problem areas, for example, the new towns, polluting industry, and transport. It will protect and enhance the environment in its wider sense. It will provide for future needs. The strategic plan will contain the following elements. Vision. It provides a long-term vision of what Prague should become in the next 10 to 20 years. It will build on the strengths and weakness, opportunities and threats analysis, which has already been undertaken, and develop into actionable programs uh, <coughs> the 10 themes which have been set for the city's future of Prague of 2010 which are a capital city, city and its population, uh, a clear, clean and healthy city in greenery, functioning and habitable city, a hospitable and friendly city, safe and considerate city, magic and unique city, university and spiritual city, a rich and prosperous city, and a city in time. Forecast of change. Strategic planning team has already produced population and housing forecasts. The strategy will also analyze the forces and direction of change brought about by social and economic pressures and develop scenarios as to how they can be accommodated. It will identify present issues and problems which, are, which cause concern, how these may change in future solutions to them will be generated. Public needs and priorities. It will elicit and incorporate the public views as to the issues and problems in Prague, the future priorities and directions, and finally, goals and objectives. It will generate goals and objectives which, have, which evolve from the vision, forecast, issues, and community views. The goals and objectives will guide the formulation of the city's strategic <coughs> and priorities for the next 10 to 20 years. Finally, just to report to you, we have started work last November, and so far we have had, it is in the form of workshops combined with seminars. Uh, uh, it starts with an with a overall view on particular subjects, both from us, from the, uh, both first of all from the Czech team and from ourselves. Then it splits up into two or three workshops, uh, who then report back to a plenum meeting when uh, discussions and finally um, um, decisions are reached how to proceed in certain in certain aspects. And uh, just to give you an idea of what has been done so far, city structure, 
Um, and you saw one of the diagrams which was already part of it. Prague is a very monocentric city, in, uh, much more than London, much more. And uh, it's overloaded. You see, the problem is that the central area of Prague coincides with the historic core. And there's a huge conflict there. And uh, the strategy should be to move out of the historic core those functions which are not essential there, and also which would enhance the identity of, of the sub-centers. So that is one strategy which we've uh, threshed out. The other one was, the second one was partnerships. Um, the whole idea that you, you proceed in partnership with the, all the people involved, and that means the public, uh, that means the city council and the citizens of Prague. It means that you bring in the entrepreneurs and the community workers, and you, instead of clashing in, uh, by opposing each other, you try to reach a consensus, because we have made it clear and that they have agreed that the future of Prague is too important to leave it to political and make it a political football. So this is, we have come a, a long way in establishing the need for consensus and partnerships. The third, the third one was on housing, a very difficult issue and one which is of great urgency because unless we, they succeed in making these uh, new settlements habitable and attractive, they could develop into, into new slums and on a huge scale. And finally, last time, I've just come back, we discussed the role of the historic core in tourism and the danger, on the one hand it attracts tourism, on the other hand tourism can, can ruin it. And uh, the historic core, uh, how to handle the historic core? There is a, there is a group of people uh, who are entirely responsible for the restoration of historic buildings. They're extremely knowledgeable and they are very rigid. They would rather have a, um, a, an authentic ruin than a not so well uh, rehabilitated building. Uh, this perhaps putting it extreme, in extreme, but uh, it's understandable. They had to. They had to fight. They had to defend uh, what they had, and the idea that it is possible to adapt. And in fact, Prague is a perfect example. Throughout the ages, there have been changes, but somehow or other, uh, these changes have been absorbed very successfully. There were certain unwritten laws how to do it. They have disappeared. We have to rewrite them now, particularly uh, to. Uh, guide developers. So there is a uh, situation is complex. The situation is, uh, on the one hand, a remarkable achievement over these years already. Uh, on the other hand, there are distinct dangers and threats. And hopefully, the strategic plan, with its clear directives and clear vision and how to achieve it, will help Prague over the next 10 to 20 years to become possibly, among other things, the central, uh, the cultural center of Central Europe. Thank you very much. clearly the, the pressures of uh, new commercial intense activity and of tourism as two obvious pressures. You also describe this very careful putting in place of the idea of strategic planning, the need to build institutions, the need to make those links, and that's clearly very deeply thought through and very important. It seems to me that with a lot of these cities, and there are, there are other cities in the similar situation, 
there needs to be some balance between the time that needs to be taken to carefully think through and put into place the, that strategic process and some need to take action immediately to, to, to reduce some of the immediate shock effect and to stop some things from happening. But this is in some ways conflicting with that process of participation, of discussion, of building up and so on. How, how do you, do you see that conflict, yes. I'm sure. Well, Is uh, that something that you're you able to, you can you to intervene to take yes, some action? Yes, you're right. There is the long-term view and there is the short-term, um, almost emergency situation. Yeah. And they have to run in parallel. I'll give you an example. One of the most pressing problems is the use of the private car which is beginning to ruin Prague, beginning to, in some areas, you see, the, 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 it's an enormous problem. The densities are much higher, several times higher than here. On a 20-foot frontage in this country, um, in the suburbs, for instance, you get a house and maybe two cars. And it's okay, it's just about okay. There on a 20-foot frontage, you get five families and at least one car each family. Yes? So it just doesn't work out. They don't park sideways, they park at, at the right angles to the curb. Um, but it's just, uh, it's not working. And so one of the really priority things is how to, how to reduce the use of the car by parking, by very strict parking. So uh, this is already happening. It, you know, there is a very quick response. It doesn't take, take very long before we get, for instance, we get the g council decisions and we are amazed how quickly they have gotten on. We have only just finished talking about it and the next council meeting they, they say, yes, we go ahead. This is now law, if, if you like. So, for instance, in, in parking. First of all, huge restrictions on, this, uh, on parking in the, in the historical, really very expensive. Very expensive, the police is very well trained and uh, very, very, very clear about it and so on. Um, that is, uh, in, in addition, there's now a program of park and ride, where at metro station they are building huge car parks, so people drive to the, to the station and leave their car and then proceed. And sometimes they're also t talking about ticketing, having it all in one ticket. And so, and these things are happening now, you see? So this is a typical example of an immediate action um, uh, to prevent things getting worse. Then there are, the, then there are these uh, settlements, um, which uh, need also very urgent action, and again, I was, very pleasantly surprised um, that the things which we discussed uh, with our Czech colleagues are actually being implemented already. Um, there's a huge program of rehabilitation. They are moving, they are moving businesses there. They are beginning to uh, move um, central, uh, from the city center, they are moving certain offices, government offices, into these new, into these new settlements. So it's beginning to, to to actually work. So it's a, having been in this business for so many years now, I'm amazed how effective we are. Much more effective than here. Maybe because, and this is a, <laughs> because so many people are not yet involved. The more people are involved, the slower the process. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I think it's terribly important that people in, uh, of Prague are, are involved at this beginning. Um, that will take time. That is a long-term thing, see? So these things have to run in parallel. But I must pay tribute to the uh, dedication, intelligence, and effectiveness of our colleagues. It really is a marvel how they have responded and how they are dedicated to their work and uh, how enthusiastic they are what they are doing. And we as uh, the British team has formed a real partnership with them. I've never worked with a group of people who were so, um, so enthusiastic and so willing to, to listen and to do the right thing as, as, uh, as it is the case in Prague. So I, I think that's a, it's not just that. It's a, you see, it only shows how terrible this 
uh, suppression was of, of all the initiatives, so all the entrepreneurial skills. In practice, Czechs are entrepreneurs, but, you know. For instance, I don't know how many of you know this, because the, che the, Czech Rep the Czechoslovakia, to the country which uh, Chamberlain um, uh, defined as very far away, of which you know very little or nothing at all, was actually second only to Switzerland in its, in its wealth, in its uh, national product and so on. And incidentally, it was the only democracy east of the Rhine before the war. You see, so that, that um, inheritance hasn't been completely forgotten or demolished. It's been passed on from parents to their children and so on. And that is the reason why they, more than any of the other Eastern European countries, have emerged uh, in the way they have. And of course, the service sector was the first to, to blossom. That is easy. <laughs> it's practically started from zero. I mean, the attitude of, um, during the uh, communist regime was for people not to sell you anything, preferably, because there was no incentive. You were paid a meager wage, but you were paid it whether you sold anything or not. And so the whole situation was negative, yeah? We haven't got it, or we've sold out. It's sort of really uh, a rather sad and just surviving existence, completely different from what, what it is now. So the spirit is there, and the will is there, and I think the intelligence is there, and the skills are there. But, as I say, the, some of the developers have done absolutely terrible things. I'll give you an example. It's a French firm which insisted they had to have the headquarters right in the old town. I showed you one of the slides. There was a Masaryk statue and people looking at placards and so on. Uh, it was uh, informing them what actually happened during the communist regime. And in a key position there, uh, between this uh, road, which is called Prikopi, which means the ditch, which used to be a ditch and, uh, around the old town, and, and, and the theater where uh, Don Giovanni's, Mozart's Don Giovanni was performed. It's a key position. And in that position, they are building now a huge office block uh, with underground car parking, I think between four and six hundred, I'm not quite sure, but it's absolutely, totally wrong. And yet, you see what happened. The previous mayor had signed a deal, and there's nothing you can do about it, you see. I mean, hopefully, it's the last of them. Huh? But these things have been happening at the time when they didn't know what they were doing. And now we are beginning to be much clearer. And the thing which they haven't yet done is to work out clear guidelines. The developer wants to know where he stands, yeah? And the whole, that it's also still bedeviled by uh, huge bureaucracy when you want to, when you want to apply to, to build a building in Prague. It's a nightmare. You need about 70 different uh, uh, permissions. Uh, the sort of thing which planning departments do as a matter of course, the fire regulation and the safety and so on. And so there's, there, it's the whole legislation, the whole um, sort of official framework is still creeping and still uh, a, you know, a residue from a, a regime which was a terribly bureaucratic regime. And that will take time. But uh, I think on the whole, it's a, it's a very hopeful situation. about uh, housing, uh, you showed an interesting slide of some uh, traditional uh, development, presumably near the center, yeah. of courtyard yes, housing. That's right. And I presumed that that was the tradition in Prague uh, and would lead, uh, as in other uh, European cities, to very high densities um, and, of course, problems about parking. Now, I'd be interested to know what density uh, the new uh, housing areas uh, are built at. 
Do uh, can you give us some idea of that? The densities are lower actually than in the courtyards, but they are still very high, right? Uh, and it is very much, the, the communists were more interested in, in fact, only in quality, in quantity, because it showed, you know, in the, on their statistics. And the quality is lacking. And it, uh, um, there are no streets and squares. Yeah? It's this sort of, you know, the open layout, spa uh, buildings and spaces. And that is very much resented now. And they are b desperately trying to get back to a traditional urban form of streets and squares. That is the first point. The second point is that in these uh, settlements, uh, there is still a very interesting social mix, which we haven't got. We usually have, uh, when we build uh, housing estates, it's relatively a narrow range of social uh, uh, categories there. Uh, by tradition, people of fairly good in high income or medium income and relatively low income still live together in these blocks. And the danger is that the people at the higher income will move out and find themselves, and this is important, they would all like houses with gardens. Yeah? Now, there is now a great sort of realization that from a sustainability point of view, we need compact cities, yeah? usually advocated by people who live in houses with gardens, incidentally. Yeah? Uh, and it just doesn't work as far as the Czechs are concerned. They, they want, they, they realize they are missing out, particularly if you have a young family. On, on the garden, and there's now a huge demand for houses with gardens. And in, in fact, the interesting thing is that the Czechs actually were very interested in the garden city before the war. And there are whole areas which are laid out as garden cities with modern, modern architecture houses. So it's a, a the, 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 the really the, the, the point I, I, I should like to make is there should be choice. Yeah? There was no choice. You either lived in these settlements or nothing at all. Now there will be more choice. But it is very important that these settlements, which as I said contain one third of Prague's population, are made attractive again so people don't leave. And so that, that it becomes a living unit rather than a dormitory again. Returning a bit to the first question and to my introductory comments about your optimistic remark in the AJ interview about the fact that uh, Prague is now is strong enough uh, uh, to confront without fears the developers. Now, uh, in your response to, to Hugo and in your presentation, one has this clear sense of a situation of, uh, you talk of administrative fragmentation of uh, institutions and legislations that are inappropriate. And it would appear that the ability to respond to those pressures are more to do in some ways, I know you didn't say exactly in these terms, but in some ways perhaps with continuity of some authoritarian top-down centralist traditions than with the creation of new democratic institutions in Prague. Um, you also gave some examples of um, developers doing and being allowed to do exactly what they shouldn't be doing. Now, in what ways, what are the kind of new uh, positive developments in terms of this more democratic, open, participatory process that you, you refer to? Um, they, uh, are there examples of that already happening? Yes. And uh, how does that relate to this well, issue again of private developers and, and the new forms of partnership between public and private that you yes. made reference Every to? single workshop is an example of that. These workshops are not just between tech, uh, you know, planners. We have invited people from the universities, from uh, technical institutes, from the business sector, from uh, um, from um, uh, representatives of local communities and so on. 
So we are already practicing this consultation process, but not just consultation, but participation. People are already contributing with their point of view, with uh, their uh, worries and their, and, their, and their desires and so on. So it is, it is already working, yeah? And, but you cannot expect as from zero public participation to full participation. It will take a long time, yeah? Even in this country, it is still not fully developed, yes? <laughs> So uh, you can't, uh, certain things take time, but uh, the will is there. The most important, the politicians want it, yeah? And just now there will be elections, and so they're all talking a lot about citizenship and public participation and so on, because they know this is, a, this is something people like to hear and like to actually, and they would like to actually, there is this will, they are not, uh, the Prague people know what they've got. They are very, they are very, very, um, if you like, possessive of it. And they are, they are very worried what could happen if the wrong thing, you know, and they are very critical of some of the work, uh, some of the developments which have taken place. So, and, uh, and the press is beginning to be very much more alert. So there's a very growing feeling uh, that Prague the future of Prague is everybody's concern, not just a few people in the city council.